Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, how many people have uh, seen the movie Top Gun? The movie Top Gun? Okay. That's, that's what I did for uh, 20 years, four months, and six days. I was a U.S. Navy fighter pilot. I flew the F-14 Tomcat. Uh, I went to Top Gun in 1981. How many people in here were born in 1981? Okay. Yeah, it was a while ago. It was three years before the movie came out. So we set the stage for Tom Cruise in that movie. And during my career in the Navy, I had the opportunity to be a maintenance officer, an operations officer, and then a commanding officer. And it's interesting because to me, reliability was very important, flying airplanes, right? What do you think? You want the airplane to do two things, don't you? What do you want it to do? Take off, and then you want to come back and land. Right? Now, oh, I'm sorry, three things. When I pulled the trigger, I wanted to have happen. <laughs> Intentionally. There were two cases during my career, 20 years, where um, pilots have shot down their wingmen. When you were doing weapons checks and all the weapons were in safe position, they pulled the, what we would do is get a, a weapons tone, pull the trigger, and a missile inadvertently would launch and shoot down their wingmen. Well, you, the next, the second word out of your mouth would be eject to your wingman, and I, I'm not going to tell you what the first word out of your mouth is <laughs> when that happens. Okay, so so when I when I had the opportunity and the invitation to come and speak at a Top Gun conference, I got very excited. Then I found out that it was a different type of Top Gun <laughs> that you guys do. Okay, and then I got excited again because to me in, in uh, my fighter squadron and what I do today in working with industry and helping them improve the reliability of their assets so that they can get more capacity out of what they've got rather than building new factories somewhere else. Okay, so that's important. And when I was a commanding officer in my squadron, we had a 98% mission capability rate. That meant that the aircraft, everything on the airplane worked 98% of the time, everything. Okay. which was pretty good. The average was about 80%. So there are certain things that you can do, and you guys are focused on the technology. So what I want to do is uh, tell you that maintenance personnel are the key to the success. It's our people out there. Of course, it's the right tools, the right time, and the right place okay. to make things work. What's the opportunity? There's the potential. This is benchmark data from about five years ago, four to five years ago. Look at the potential out there. The percentage of money that's spent for the world's gross domestic product and the percentage of that that's related to industry, manufacturing. Okay, we're looking at $14.9 uh, trillion. Now, the maintenance spend alone on that is how much? What's the opportunity? $447 billion in opportunity. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, money out there. There's a lot of need for what we do. Here's some data, benchmark data, of different industry verticals and about where the average is relative to best practice. Okay, so you can see about the only one that has a proactive posture up there is pharmaceuticals. They tend to be pretty good, but there's still a lot of gap between where the pharmaceuticals average is and where best practice could be. And we're talking about condition-based maintenance as being a best practice. Okay, so now we know we've got a business case. We can start to put it together. There's opportunity and industry verticals. You see them listed up there. There's opportunity because they're not operating at best practice. That means there's a lot of waste going on in the manufacturing system. Does anybody in here participate with organizations or in an organization that's doing lean manufacturing? Lean? Okay. So in lean manufacturing, what we want to do is eliminate waste in how we produce finished products. Raw material comes in through a flow, and in manufacturing, it's converted into a finished product, and it's measured in cost per unit. So from a lean perspective, from a production or operations perspective, what we want to do 
is eliminate the waste so that our cost per unit is lower. If you have lower cost per unit, what does that mean in terms of profit? More profit, more profit. The problem that I find in industry is that when you look at these numbers, pulp and paper, 468, automotive, 465. Uh, metals and mining, or I'm sorry, chemical processing is, is the one that has the uh, uh, proactive posture, close to proactive. Okay, that, that means that there's still waste in their systems. The problem is, is that lean manufacturing relies on reliable assets. Your assets have to be in like new condition and you've got to have processes in place that keep them in like new condition. Too often I see industry, a, a plant, that will try to do lean manufacturing and they've got their machines breaking down all the time. So there's so much noise in the manufacturing system, you don't know what's production, what's a common cause, and what's a special cause with regard to the assets. So asset health, asset reliability is key. Then what we can focus on is eliminating waste in our production side. Here's the areas of return. Labor utilization. Okay, I don't say labor cuts because that's the old paradigm. When, when production and profits are driven by financial people, what happens is you'll say we're going to get all of these efficiencies when we implement new processes and new technology. So what's the first thing that the finance people do? Cut, right? Cut, pe or cut heads. Too often, they cut before the processes have a chance to take effect. So we never get the full benefits of putting a new program in place. We cut headcount, and then everybody says something like, whoa, every time we do a new improvement initiative around here, I get more work to do. Who's ever felt that way before? Yeah, okay, and there's a reason for that. It's the way, it's the, the current paradigm in industry, the way we operate. Anyone uh, heard of the word paradigm before? Okay, the, another word is mental models, how we see the world. And a mental model is made up of your experience, your values, what you believe, and what you know, your knowledge. Okay, knowledge, values, and experience. Of those three things that each one of you have, which one do you think I can influence almost immediately? Which one? What's that? Knowledge, right? So what we need to do is start the path of profound knowledge, that journey where we begin to give information to people and help them see old problems with new eyes. Okay. To change the paradigms. As your paradigm and your beliefs and what you know change, you make different decisions, different choices, and your experiences start to change. Okay. So uh, uh, Deming, anybody heard of uh, Deming? total quality management, right? He always said the key to implementation of a new way of doing things is a pilot project. Not for the benefits that you're going to get out of the pilot project, but to show a success so people will believe that yes, this can work. It's to create a new experience. Reliability engineering and maintenance. Here's some data up here. Basically, if you look up in the upper right hand box, what that shows is the more coverage you have with predictive maintenance, the lower your maintenance costs are. Okay? And this is from, from uh, uh, multiple, multiple benchmark studies. In the lower right-hand corner, what it shows is that the more equipment that you have on time-based programs, the higher your maintenance costs are. Okay? Interesting paradigm, right? There's the data to support it. Why is that? Well, we know from other studies, Navy nuclear submarine community and the Boeing 747. If you put a Boeing 747 on a time-based program, it would never fly. It's so big, so large, so complex that you would always be doing preventative maintenance inspections on it. Okay, so what this tells us is 89% of our failures are random. Only about 11% are related to age, age related. So that means that most of our equipment that isn't on a run to fail strategy 
should be covered, at least 89%, by some type of predictive technology. Only 11% by preventative maintenance. Okay, so what does this mean? You could probably delete right now 21% of the preventative maintenance routines in an organization that's in a reactive range. 21%. In the US Navy project that I was on, and I'm going to share with you in a few minutes, we ended up eliminating almost 40% of the preventative maintenance routines. Okay? And a lot of those routines were the result of a knee-jerk reaction. Do you understand what I mean when I say knee-jerk reaction? There was an emergency breakdown. Everybody ran around trying to put the fire out or move the fire around. And then what was the result? We're not going to do that again. Let's put it on some kind of a, a preventative maintenance routine so we can come in and inspect it every time. As opposed to, different paradigm, let's put it on a predictive technology routine, identify the defect as close to the point where it's entered, and that gives us time now to fix it. If it's hot, if you can hear it, smell it, it's too late. Take a look at a PM evaluation, and this is from an actual project in a plant. About 40,000 hours were eliminated from uh, preventative maintenance routines by eliminating completely the PM or assigning it to operations. That's the equivalent of 20 people. 20 people, adding 20 people to your payroll. I was in a plant about three months ago. And you know what they told me? They said, Mike, we need more maintainers. We need more mechanics. Have you ever heard that before? A reactive organization and they need more people because they just can't keep up with all the repairs. And I'll tell you the story. It was in a pump shop. They had 92 pumps in backlog. They should have had 14 pumps, 12 to 14 in backlog. They could only repair six pumps a month. They should be repairing about 12 pumps a month. So the, there were two problems. The pumps were failing faster than their ability to repair them, and they weren't repairing them as quickly as they should. So you know what the pump shop said? We need more people so we can repair them faster. So what we did is a root cause analysis of why are your pumps failing so fast. Well, it's because the, the pipes are breaking and water's getting on the pumps. It's getting into the oil, and we're getting bearing failures. Okay, so what's the next question you ask? Why are the pipes breaking? Well, it's because they lo the, uh, the, the, we lose pressure, and then when the pressure comes back up, there are old pipes, the scaling breaks loose, and the pipes start uh, springing leaks. So what's the next question you ask? Why are you losing pressure, exactly? Well, we've got problems with, with our, our, gl our glands over here. The seals aren't as good as they should be. Okay, well, there, if we solve that, we can slow down the rate that the pumps are failing. Now, why is it that you can only repair six a month when you should be repairing 10 to 12? Spare parts. We don't have enough spare parts. Okay, well, we need to get the plant manager engaged so that you can get the budget to buy the spare parts and the authorization to do it. You know what they told me? Oh, we already got authorization and the money. So, so what's the problem? We don't have a laydown area to put all the parts that we need to start to repair the pumps. I said, so how do you set priorities? He said, well, we go down the list, number one critical, number two critical, number three. Whatever we have the available parts for, that's what I put my team on working until somebody comes in and starts screaming about number one. Then we drop everything, run around like crazy to get what we need and, and start to work on that pump. I said, okay, great. So why don't we rent some C boxes? Who knows what a C box is? from container ships, right? Let's go rent some and lay them out. And, put, and you know what? One of the guys sitting at the table, this was a cross-functional meeting while we were doing the root cause analysis, you know what he said? Oh, we got four empty ones sitting right out there. <laughs> they already had the solution. They just weren't talking to each other. They just weren't talking to each other. Okay. So what we went from, we need three more mechanics to doing what? operating a little bit differently. 
So we had to actually get them into a, a, a posture where things were fixed, and then we were able to start talking about maybe implementing some predictive technologies. Here's the before and after. You got 43 techs doing uh, pure PM work in a proactive organization once you get the technology and the processes and the culture in place. What do I mean when I say organization culture? People who believe, understand, and will do what they're required to do. They will follow the processes. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've gone in an organization and somebody has said, you know, Mike, we got processes, we just don't follow them. And my next question is, what allows you not to follow them? Let's do a root cause on that. Okay. Hidden capacity, active repair time, 35%. Best of class, we want to see 45 to 50% wrenches doing work. 35%. A lot of time is wasted. A lot of time is wasted. So there's lots of potential out there, not just in how maintenance gets done, but in assets being available to work and produce. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story right now. Nothing was missing, but we found three more. Okay. When I retired from the Navy, I went to work for a, a, a large organization. I was a director of corporate planning. It was a large retail company. So about, a, about eight months into my job, the chief executive officer called me into his office and said, Mike, we're failing. We're going out of business unless we make a dramatic change. And I went, wow, that's great to know. You know, I, I, I'm freshly retired, my very first job, and we're going out of business. The problem was is that we were competing with Walmart. Uh, uh, there's a, a company called Target, who, who shopped in a Target or heard of Target, okay? At that time, in the early 90s, Target was going reg uh, uh, national, and they were building stores right across the street from our stores. We had to change the way we did business. Customer service was, a, uh, was, was unknown. I, have you ever had this experience when you go shopping and you go to check out and the cashiers are engaged in a conversation and you feel like you're interrupting them, right? Or you go to buy something on the shelf, you've got your, how many people write lists when you go shopping? I'm a list writer, right? So I go in and I'd like to find everything I need. One stop shopping. The problem is, is that I would go there and there'd be empty merchandise on the shelf and I'd say, how long, uh, uh, when do you expect to get some in? Oh, we don't know. Usually comes in two or three weeks. Just keep checking back with us. Okay, at Walmart, I would say, how long? And they'd go over to the computer and say, we got six arriving at midnight tonight. Um, I'll hold one for you. You can come back at 10 a.m. and pick it, pick it up. Got an enabling system in place, right? Great customer service. Okay. And that was our problem. So he said, here's your challenge. You're a, Na you're a retired Navy commander. You know about leadership. I had a master's degree in industrial psychology from the University of Pisa in Italy when I was attending the Italian War College. And yes, the Italians do study the art of war. Okay, but there's, how, how you execute that is, is debatable, and we can talk about that on the side. Okay. <laughs> so my job was to be the change manager. I was to focus on process and people. And we had a project manager who focused on the technology. We re-engineered business processes and we configured SAP, the software technology, to support that. And it was about a three to five year journey to implement the technology and the process and the culture change to get people to think differently and behave differently. And it started with lots of training and lots of information to start to change the mindsets of the people. So after five years, we were very successful, and I got a call from the U.S. Navy. Mike, we want you to come back to work for us as a senior civilian. We've got a problem. I said, okay, great. What is it? You remember uh, in the late 90s now, the Soviet Union had dissolved and broken up. Prior to that, our uh, strategy, our war strategy, was to be able to fight two wars simultaneously in two different parts of the world. We had a two and a half million person force, lots of 700 ship navy, 
And then at the end of the, uh, the 90s, uh, what was, uh, uh, President Clinton said, we're going to reap a peace dividend. So we begin to close Navy bases, draw down the, the size of the forces, and retire ships, go down to a 250-ship Navy. New threat began to emerge. What, was, what is that threat today? Terrorism. We're at war on terrorism. So in the late 90s, we saw this emerging. So we had to structure the forces, restructure the U.S. Armed Forces to be a rapid response force leveraging technology. Okay. So with fewer numbers, we had to be much more responsive and use technology as what's called a force multiplier. So in our studies, what we realized we had to do was retire the last three conventional aircraft carriers. And I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, Boy, they just don't make them the way they used to. Every aircraft carrier I've cruised on, there are four of them, and every airplane I've flown during my Navy career, they're all retired now. But I'm still going. <laughs> so it's proof that failure modes, you know, it, it's, it's how well you take care of the asset is how long it's going to last, right? Okay, so what we had to do then is build three new nuclear carriers to replace the three conventional carriers and present our, our recommendations to Congress and how we were going to restructure the U.S. Navy. Anybody in here ever buy a, uh, uh, an aircraft carrier before? Raise your hand. Who's bought an aircraft carrier? How, how much, last week, how much does one cost, a brand new one, without the air wing on it? About $15 billion. So we needed three of those. $45 billion bogey, right? Congress said, okay, we like your plan, approved. Uh, go ahead, and as we're walking out the door, you know what they said? Oh, by the way, we're not going to recapitalize it. You got to take the money out of hide, out of your out of your budget. I was like, whoa! How are we going to come up with forty-five billion dollars in five years to start all the, the the rebuild of these aircraft carriers to respond to the er emergent threat of terrorism? So we started to look at it, and we had a lot of waste in the way we t maintain our ships. Uh, typical aircraft carrier availability was one year. It would go, any, any ex-Navy guys in here? Okay, feel free to relate, raise your hand, nod your head, throw your stories out there. So we would take a carrier into dry dock, and in one year, one year you would do your, your, your maintenance from stem to stern. Just repair, replace, whatever it was. They had a schedule. Over uh, hundreds of thousands of different tasks that were being done and had to be coordinated. And we did a lot of stupid things. Like a maintenance crew would come up and do a hull cut because you couldn't get the equipment down in to, to, to where the machinery was that you were going to repair. So you had to cut a big plate out of the side of the ship. Go in, the maintenance team would go in, do their re repair, come out. Now, what do you got to do with that big plate? got to weld it right back in place, right? And just as they were finishing that weld, the next crew would show up to work on a di different piece of equipment in the same space. So now what do you got to do? Cut another hole. You can't do the same one. You got to overlap it like this. If you look down the side of a ship, any museums and stuff, and you look, you can see the scars from all the hull cuts on the side of the ship. They do the same thing on submarines too, okay? So we had a lot of coordination issues. You know, now you're a project manager, and, we, and there was the Longshoremen Union. Longshoremen got paid two rates. They got paid a dock rate, and they got paid a rate when they were on the ship working. The dock rate was way lower than the actual on-the-ship working rate. So you're a project manager now. The crew shows up to work, but you don't have the material and spare parts. So what, do you want to let that crew on your ship? No. Why not? So now we, you hear stories about going out and seeing all the union workers standing around not doing anything. It's because we train them not to do anything. Or on the other side, you get material that would show up and have no crew ready. And now what happens to the material? Maybe it takes a bruise, a ding, starts to rust, gets a defect in it from sitting out on the pier. Okay. Um, planners and schedulers, they would, when they were planning an availability, would order... 125% of the materials necessary to do the availability. 120. Why were they ordering more than they needed? What's that? Pilferage. Pilferage. 
How about this? There was no visibility in the supply system. You didn't know when the materials were going to show up. No vendor report cards. We didn't know how long this vendor would take to deliver. Sometimes it'd show up in two weeks. Sometimes it'd be five weeks. So what you want to do is make sure you get the material when you need it. So the best way to do that is order more than you need. So at the end of the availability, what do you do with that 25% that you have left over? Anybody been in a shipyard before? Yeah, that's another story. Yeah, Scrapyard, they, they, they'd have lay down areas. Go to a shipyard, you'll see all of this material laying down out there. Now you would think that the next availability, the planners and schedulers will remember that they have this extra stuff, right? So instead of ordering 125%, how much would they order? They should, right? Nope, another 125%. So as a result, all of this excess inventory starts to build up, build up, build up. Just by eliminating that problem alone, you're saving $12 million a year just in carrying costs, the cost to keep this type of merchandise. So we had a lot of waste in the way we maintain our ships, right? We had a financial system that rewarded spending. Any, uh, Here's the way it worked. <clears throat> you get a budget for the year. If you have money left over at the end of the year and you turn it back in, what happens to your budget the next year? It gets cut by how much? Probably that and a bit more. That and a bit more. And then for the next year, you get additional goals because you lied to me about how much money you needed, right? So I'm going to, give you, I'm going to ask you to do more with even less budget. So all it takes is once... Right? So the next time you get down to the end of the year, you're doing a really good job of managing your budget, of achieving your objectives, and you got money left over, what do you do with it? Spend, you're darn right you spend it. You're darn right you spend it. Use it or lose it. Okay? So lots of waste in our system. So what the Navy said is we're going to re-engineer our processes, how we manage our material, what our work control looks like. We're going to evaluate our preventative maintenance routines. We're going to go into condition-based maintenance posture, okay. reliability engineering. We re-engineered those processes, and again, we used SAP as the CMMS, Computerized Maintenance Management System, configured it to support the new processes, and my role was the change manager. 36,000 people in uh, the Naval Sea Systems Command doing maintenance on ships to get them to think differently to start to operate differently and use the technologies that were being installed, use it properly. The end result was we went from a one-year availability period down to four months. So the carrier would come in and then four months later it's out ready to operate again. Now here was the other problem with a one-year availability. You've got a crew that's not doing anything except chipping, paint, painting and cleaning for a year. What happens to their skills, their war fighting skills? They drop. Okay, well, you'll send them off to training, but there's no real opportunity to use it. So at the end of the year, the ship would have to go out on a shakedown cruise and refresher training. The shakedown cruise was make sure your valves are aligned, start to work your equipment to get it within the acceptable tolerances all of those types of things, and exercise the crew to get their skills back up. So that would take at least another year. So that carrier was not available for two years. Now we've gone from a year of maintenance to four months. We used technology to have the crews do what are called fast cruises. They would link in with other ships through computers and do simulated exercises. So they would keep their skills up to speed. So that ship's ready to go. And you know what the equivalent was of all that eight months that normally would have been tied up in a shipyard? What's that asset ready to do now? It's ready to operate. It was the equivalent of three, a little more than three aircraft carriers. So we got more capacity out of existing assets by leveraging technology, process, and people. Okay. Nothing was missing, but we found three more. You know how much that project cost? A little over $200 million. And we got the money, it already existed in budgets, by sunsetting or closing 144 different systems 
different information systems that were used. I spent about a year up at the Pentagon talking to anybody that had a star on their collar to convince them that the right thing to do was to give me their budget and we were going to turn off their uh, uh, information system to support them and they were going to use SAP and it was going to meet all of their needs. What do you think? <laughs> you think that was a challenge? Right? You think that was a challenge? So there, you know, that was the political arena. You got to play in the political arena. Get people to give up control. There's got to be a what's in it for me. Why should I do this? Because I'm not held accountable for that. I'm held accountable for this, and you got to show me how that's going to help me do my job and convince them. Okay. How do you get there from here? A so, bunch of studies done. The primary one was uh, from uh, MIT. And what this says is that technology, if you do just a pure technology implementation, focus on, on, on the technology, the likelihood of achieving your return on, on uh, investment is very low. In fact, you'll probably have a backslide. It will not be used. Has anybody in here ever heard of or used the expression flavor of the day? or flavor of the month. Who's, who's used flavor of the month, okay? So if you focus purely on technology as the solution, you're very likely to end up with a flavor of the month, okay? Business process and culture change, changing behavior and beliefs in an organization. If you just focus on process and culture change, your likelihood of success is about 27% getting about 27% of your return on investment. So what that tells us is you need a blended approach. It's the power of and. It's technology plus process plus behavior. And that's a huge challenge. And when I go into organizations and I have these types of discussions with the leaders, they go, wow, this is bigger than we thought. We thought it was just a maintenance initiative. But maintenance in an organization does not have enough power and authority to drive this type of change. So if you want to implement technology, get production involved and make the case. This is how this technology will help you run your assets at 100% their design capacity, at the quality you want, when you want. You push the green button and it runs. How many people have talked to mechanics or maintenance technicians when they go to the operator to get the equipment and the operator is reluctant to give up that equipment because it never runs the same when you give it back to me after you fixed it. Who's had that experience? I heard somebody laugh out there. All right. We require two things, management and leadership. Management is the efficiency side, leadership is the effective side. The problem is patience. Patience. It takes at least 8 to 18 months to begin to change behaviors. I can implement technology in a couple weeks. To get the processes that support the technology and getting people to use it takes about 8 to 18 months if you've got engaged leadership at an organization. Okay. Here are a couple values. A couple values I want to share with you. 80% 3 out of 4, 40% and 29%. Is anybody in here a project management professional, PMP certified? Okay, PMI, Project Management Institute, sets the criteria. There are 12, uh, nine processes for managing projects. What PMI did, Project Management Institute did, is a study. They reversed engineered failed projects. And we're talking capital improvement size projects. Okay. And failure is defined as exceeded time, exceeded cost, and did not return the investment in the business case. You know what 80% of the root causes for failure were? Breakdowns in communication. Breakdowns in communication. 80%. Okay, does that have anything to do with technology? Okay. Now this is one that was near and dear to me right here, this three out of four. Three out of four airplane crashes are the result of human error. It's actually uh, it's actually more. It's about 3.4. But we'll, we'll, f you know, for math purposes, we'll keep it at 3 out of 4. That means 75 out of every 100 airplanes that crash, who's responsible? 
a human being, right? Now, here's an interesting number. 60% of those, almost 50 out of 100 airplane crashes, are the results of breakdowns in communication. Think about it. 50 airplanes out of every 100 perfectly good airplanes that are capable of flying crash because of breakdowns in communication. Hearing information, misinterpreting information, miscommunicating, misunderstanding between the, the crew and the cockpit or between different airplanes. Is that significant or what? Okay? Doesn't matter how much technology or reliability we have in the airplanes, you still have that human factor. And what are we doing today about that? I was watching a, a history channel and it was talking about the uh, stealth fighter and its role in the last war. And you know, the entire mission, except for the part where they drop the bomb, is flown by computer. So if you got a problem with the human, you try to factor it out. Don't we automate things in our factories, okay, to get efficiencies in time? But you still have that human component. The component in our manufacturing system that has the most variation in performance is the human being. Who's heard of Six Sigma? Any, any green belts or black belts in here? We want to drive variation and process in, in uh, operation down to 0.000001%. The best you can do with human behavior is about three sigma. Following processes and procedures 95 to 98% of the time. 40% and 29%. Harvard Business Review did a study back in the mid 80s. When 40%, if you're implementing something new in your organization and 40% of the workforce can clearly identify why we're doing this, what it looks like, how it will affect them, what's in it for them, and what you're exp expecting them to do, and 29% are actively engaged in implementing the technology and process, you've reached the critical mass. Or in today's terms, it's called tipping point. Who's heard of the tipping point or critical mass? Any nuclear uh, engineers in here? What's a critical mass? It's when, when, when a change starts to become self-sustaining. This is when you get a pull, when people want it, instead of trying to push it on them. So the challenge is to create that tipping point. How do you engage your people and how do you communicate to them and get them the information they need? Well, the rule for communication, I'll give you the mathematical formula. 6x plus 3x. You got to hear it six times, the same message, from at least three different people. Okay, you hear it six times to understand it from three different people to believe to believe it. It's human nature to close gaps. How do I activate this? Do I just hit click? Here we go. Oops. I'm going to watch a little video. Has anyone seen this video before? Yeah? We do a restart? Okay, the point that we're trying to make with this video is the fact that we get information as human beings with our paradigm. We're going to filter that information. When we filter the information, we assign meaning to it based on what makes sense to us. So in the video, you've got uh, two doctors. There's a fly bothering them while they're examining the patient. He's got a broken leg. So the one doctor takes the defibrillators and he zaps the fly with it. And he looks over and he says, that killed it, just as the mom and daughter walk in. And they hear the doctor say, that killed him. And what do they think? Think the doctor killed 
the, the husband or the dad, right? And he was talking about the fly. Okay, so let's think about those numbers. Go ahead. Don't judge too quickly. And that's the key point is when I say patience and it takes at least 8 months to 18 months to change behavior, this is why. People will close gaps. They will, they will put, add information to what they don't know or don't understand that makes sense to them. And when people do that, they always do it on the positive, right? It's always a good thing for change in new technology. Is that right? No. Now it's always the negative side. They're going to look at the downside on it. Uh, I want to do a real quick experiment right now. Everybody get something to write with. Something to write with. Piece of paper and a crayon or a pen or something like that. I'm going to say a word. This is word association. Okay. I'm going to say a word. And I want you to write down the first word that comes to your mind. Okay, ready? The word is dog. Write down a word. What do you think about when I say dog? Okay, everybody stand up. Stand up. If you wrote down cat, sit down. If you wrote down cat, sit down. Okay, if you wrote down the name of a dog, a pet, go ahead and sit down. Okay, if you wrote down food, dog food, sit down. Okay, if you wrote down something that a dog would wear, like a collar or a leash, sit down. Okay, good. What did you write? Bite. Bite. <laughs> good. Go ahead and sit down. What did you write? Friend. 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 Who else did friend? Okay, go ahead and sit down. Good. What did you write? Uh, uh, animal. Animal. Who wrote animal? Down. Everybody that wrote animal, sit down. Okay, go ahead. What did you write? Husky. Husky. Okay. Loyal. Loyal. Anyone else put loyal? Okay, go ahead and sit down. What did you write? Pet. What's that? Pet. pet. Any up? Put pet. Any other pets? Okay. Protection. Protection. Good. Go ahead and sit down. Bark. Anyone else barks? Okay. What did you put down? Fire I just made up a word. Very good. Very good. Okay. You know what we got here? We got a nice bell curve distribution, didn't we? If I were to plot this out, I would, I would have a bell curve. Something like, how did I know that that was going to happen? I already had this bell curve written on a, on a uh, piece of paper up there. We did a little word association and we assigned multiple meanings to the word dog based on what made sense to you. I just communicated the vision of this change, of this new program we're going to implement. And how many interpretations of that vision do we have out here? How many people are in this room? Right? Well, Husky, that was the dog that I had in my mind. That's the program. So let me add another word to the first word. If I said dog and snow, if I said dog, snow, and sled, Dog, snow, sled, Alaska. Dog, snow, sled, Alaska, race, or Iditarod. Would you start to think about a husky now? Okay, so it would take me at least five or six times to communicate to get the majority of that bell curve thinking husky. Thinking husky. Okay, so communication is critical. If you're going to implement something, make sure people understand what dog is. What's the formula? 6x plus 3x equals dog. <laughs> now, here's a bell curve distribution. Behavior, human behavior will fall out. If I have clearly defined processes, standard work, an accountability system in place, I can reduce that variation in human behavior to about three sigma. Tighten it right up. 
Let me give you an example in my fighter pilot days when I was a commanding officer. Who's seen the movie Top Gun again? All right, what are some characteristics of a Navy fighter pilot that you saw in the movie Top Gun? What was Tom Cruise like? Cocky. Cocky. What else? Confident. Confident. What else? What's that? Irresponsible. Irresponsible. What else? He was a risk taker. Motivated. Motivated. Okay. Was he arrogant? Oh, yeah. Arrogant, yeah. You know what? I've only made one mistake in my life. I thought I was wrong, but I wasn't. <laughs> It's the only mistake I ever made. Okay, so you know what's interesting is that we go out and we will recruit that type of behavior to put in the cockpit of a high performance aircraft. Flying 700, 800 knots at sea level, things happen very fast. Happen very fast. And the problem is, is that when you recruit behavior, you're going to get a bell curve distribution, right? So that, that type of uh, distribution where they ex express those characteristics to a very high degree, those are the types of pilots who will like to fly their airplanes underneath bridges. Kind of like Maverick, right? Why do they fly their airplanes underneath bridges? Because they can. Because they can, right? And after a while, when that excitement and that rush wears off, what do they start to do then? Lower bridges. Lo find lower bridges or fly upside down underneath bridges until what eventually happens? They'll crash. They'll crash. Now on the other side, over here, you get it to a lesser extent. You know, almost the difference between a bomber and a fighter pilot, right? Over here. So, uh, do you guys remember, uh, the, anybody in here remember the Iranian hostage crisis in 1980-81? Okay. Anybody remember studying about it in history class in high school? Okay, Dur during 1980, uh, the Shah of Iran was uh, um, assassinated, and uh, the Americans in the embassy in Iran were taken hostage for almost a year, and it was a crisis. The irony is, is that while we were allied with Iran, we sold them F-14 Tomcats with Phoenix missile. We t I went through pilot training with Iranian pilots. We taught them our tactics and how to fight air combat. So now, the USS Nimitz launched that failed rescue mission. Do you remember seeing that on History Channel? The C-130 collided with the helicopter with the special forces in the desert during a sandstorm. And then uh, President Carter aborted the mission. Well, here was the fear. Now, I never explained this, uh, could understand this rationale until I became a senior decision maker and had my lobotomy, okay? There was a fear of a retaliation strike on the USS Nimitz by, by Iran because it had launched the strike. So they pulled the USS Nimitz off of station, and the USS Nimitz had two, air, two uh, squadrons of F-14s. And the nearest ready aircraft carrier was the USS Independence with Ensign Mike Aroni flying the F-4 Phantom. That airplane was older than me. It was built in the mid-50s. So now we're going with 50s technology against the latest and greatest technology that we had sold to once a friend, now an enemy, and we're off station, not knowing if we're going to go into combat every day, any day, at any moment, or get attacked. You know what that's like? That's like me taking a stick and poking it into a hornet's nest, and then say, here you go, Doug, take that stick, and I want you to go stand over there right next to that nest. Okay? That's what it felt like. Somebody had stuck the stick into the hornet's nest, and then we were asked to go stand next to it with the stick. So it's interesting because there was a pilot in my squadron. He was a commander. He had just uh, made selection for commander and was being screened to take over command of his squadron. And at that point in time, we had very little, most of our time, about 99% of our time was spent training for combat and probably about 1% in actual conflict. Grenada, Panama, that type of stuff. So he never really faced the threat of going into combat. And when in that situation, fly, flying an older technology aircraft against the latest technology, you know what he did? He resigned. He took his wings off and said, I refuse to fly. He had about three years left to get his retirement of 20 years. And you cannot make a military pilot fly. So within two hours, he was off the ship. 
I've got stationed somewhere, finished out this last three years and retired from the U.S. Navy. He's, a, he's an airline pilot now. But look at that variation of behavior. You got the guy that refuses to go into combat and the guy that you, you can't keep him from doing crazy things and killing himself. Okay, how do I, as a commanding officer now, get that behavior nice and tight? Getting everybody to follow me into combat and follow the rules, the standard operating procedures. Same thing you do anywhere you go. Number one, selection. I want to get people with the right attitudes. If I already have people working for me, I get their attitudes right. Get their attitudes right. How do I do that? Leadership. Leadership is about identifying what your people need and helping meet their needs. If you're not meeting the needs of the people working for you in an organization, they will find ways of acting out. Okay. The whole need for collective bargaining and unions comes from the fact that people's needs aren't being met. Right. So they have to collective bargain in order to get things that they want and need. Okay. What else? Training. I got to make sure that you're going to follow me. I use good leadership, get your attitudes right, but you got to know what the heck it is you're doing. You got to know how to do it. So the first thing, if I have a, 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 a spike, a variation from standard, I'll evaluate, was it me? Was it leadership? Did you know what you were supposed to do? What you were expected to do? Okay. Were your needs met? And did you know how to do it? Okay, if that's the case, then you need a reinforcing system. The only time I would discipline somebody is it, it, for lack of motivation. They knew what they were supposed to do. They knew how to do it. They had everything they needed, but they chose not to. Okay, so you get a look at those, those four things. And a reinforcing system. Let me give you an example of a reinforcing system in a fighter squadron. Okay. Uh, we had this big board up in front of the ready room. Now, did anybody say that fighter pilots have big egos? Right, big egos. I, I only made a mistake once in my life. I thought I was wrong, but I wasn't. Very difficult to admit you make mistakes, sometimes to a fault. Okay, Fail, failing to assume, accept responsibility for your actions and blaming it on other factors is a relievable behavior. We will actually take people out of the pilot program because that is a dangerous uh, tendency. Okay, no apparent fear of death is what it, what the official term is. No apparent fear of death. All right, so we got this big old uh, we called it a hit board. Anybody who observed one of their squadron mates varying from the standard, from the standard operating procedure, was allowed to go up there as the hitter and say, Doug, here, here's what Doug did. Okay? Doug gets in his F-14, he's going to go out on a mission. He taxis down to the hold short at the end of the runway and goes to call tower for takeoff. Okay, well, the F-14 has two radios. It's got a back seat radio and a front seat radio. Back seat radio is where you talk to base, to maintenance, to troubleshoot, and to your wingman. The front seat radios, you talk to controllers, controlling agency. Well, Doug doesn't check, and he's got his switch in the back seat position and thinks he's talking to the tower, but who's he talking to? His wingman and everybody back at maintenance and in the, in the ready room where the pilots hang out. So Doug says, Tower, this is Starfighter 201, request takeoff. And you just told the world that you made a mistake, a communication mistake. Remember I, t I told you that communication kills 50 out of 100 people in crashes? And that was my stickler. So everybody's fighting to go up to that hit board to put Doug's name up there, calling uh, base uh, and thinking he was on Tower for takeoff. All right? Now, of course, we're going to have to play around with you because I had two rules. Work hard, take care of your family. Three rules. Work hard, take care of your family, and have fun. Those were the, the squadron rules. Work hard, take care of your family, and have fun. Okay? Not much. Basic guidelines. So now we're going to have fun with Doug. So somebody picks up the microphone and says, 201, your request for takeoff is denied. Be advised that due to a national emergency, the airways are saturated with B-52s your signal returned to base for full armament load. And now Doug is going, whoa, what happened? So, but by the, you know, from the time I left 
uh, the maintenance to get down here for takeoff, we're at war. Now, now Doug's thinking, well, that's a little radical. What, something, something's up. And he looks around and realizes he had the radio in the wrong position. And he, uh, he puts it up and takes off and goes and does his mission. And he comes back, and there's his name right up on the board. So we would fill that board up with names and, and uh, deviations from standard. And once a month, we would go over to the officer's club and have a kangaroo court. Does anyone know what a kangaroo court is? What's a kangaroo court? Just try them right on the spot and decide. Yep. You get, you get a chance to defend yourself before you're found guilty. Okay? But you get, the fun part is in the defense. So the more creative you are, the less the fine is going to be, but you're still going to be found guilty, and you have to put money in the jar. Okay? So, I mean, we, we had some really creative defenses. One guy brought Madame Penelope, the palm reader, who had a little shop out the front gate of the base, and she came in to explain how these stars and planets were aligned in such a way that caused that switch to be in the wrong position. It was not Doug's fault. You know, that's pretty good. Guilty, five bucks in the jar. Okay, and then uh, one person brought his mother in. His mother happened to be visiting. And I said, oh, because I get to be the judge and the jury. So I'm up there and I've got a robe on and, you know, the whole thing with the gavel. And I, oh, Ma, yeah, Mom, come on up here, sit next to me. Get, we made her the guest of honor, and she wrote her son a note. Please excuse my son, Doug. He'll never do it again. It wasn't his fault, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's been having a bad day and all of this stuff. And I said, oh, thanks, Mom. Uh, guilty. <laughs> Ten bucks in the jar. Five for you and five for bringing your mother in, getting her involved with your mistakes. Okay? So what do you think, guys? We're having fun, right? But what about those fighter pilot egos? Do you think they like... The fact that they've made mistakes being highlighted and laughed at? Uh-uh, uh-uh. So you know what? I hit Doug. Guess what he's doing? He's watching me. Yeah, all right, Mike, you just make one mistake, and, man, I'm, I'm going to be the first one up there hitting you. Okay, so what do you think with this tiny little reinforcing system called a hit board st started to happen to our variation from standard in the squadron? We started to self-check, self-correct. Okay, good idea? Yeah? Okay, that's an example of a reinforcing system. Okay, we, we, Mike, we have processes, we just don't follow them. What allows you not to follow them? Do the root cause analysis on that, put the fix in, and it's usually going to be a behavior and a process. We have the technology, we're just not using it, or using it the way it's supposed to. What's allowing you to do that? Okay.